with our uh, final forum of this evening. These are for the uh, legislative candidates who are seeking votes and support from um, residents in Brunswick County. We have four candidates running for two seats, uh, District 17 and District 18. Unfortunately, a late um, issue uh, came up and um, Susie Hamilton, the District 18 incumbent, could not make it this evening. But we do have Gerald Benton, the candidate for District 18, along with Frank Eiler, the District 17 representative, and the challenger in District 17, Charles Warren. A round of applause for our three candidates, if you would, please. We are going to continue our uh, forums with the same uh, way we did the first three this evening. Uh, each one of our candidates will get a 60-second opening statement. We'll have uh, several questions developed by the uh, board of the ABCPOA, and then the candidates will get a 60-second closing statement, and then we have a short close by the head of the ABCPOA. We're going to go with our uh, alphabetical order. We'll begin with the candidate for District 18, 60-second opening statement from candidate Gerald Benton. Mr. Benton, 60 seconds, please. Thank you. I want to thank you all for coming out tonight. It's getting late. I know the World Series game's on, and there's other things you could be doing out here, especially when we're voting already. But my name is Gerald Benton. I live here in Brunswick County. My district, I'm just so you all know, is going to go from Bolivia up to UNCW, so most of my district is, in fact, in New Hanover County. I see that we have a lack of leadership here in our district. We're not being represented. You know, we have somebody who lives downtown Wilmington. A lot of our interests on this side of the bridge are not taken care of. We have to continue on all this great work the Republicans have done. I mean, we see that our schools have gone from 37 to 19 in student achievement. We're seeing tax rates drop. And I want to focus now, us now on education and mental health. We need to make sure that our education system enables school choice and that we are able to give people the opportunity to get their children out of schools that are not necessarily doing well and make sure that they have the ability to succeed. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next for an opening statement, the District 17 candidate, Mr. Frank Eiler. Mr. Eiler, 60 seconds. Thank you, John. You know, John has uh, done several of these forums, and actually Thursday night will be raising money uh, in Brunson County for communities and schools. So thank you, John. Thank you, sir. And uh, ABC POA, I was a uh, HOA president in another town for a small HOA, and I can appreciate what some of the officers and uh, and members of the HOAs go through and the POAs. So uh, I'm glad to be here. Uh, actually, the last five to six years, uh, we have been able to lower taxes, uh, reduce regulation, uh, and streamline res regulation so that, that they come up for review every few years and get eliminated if they're not necessary. So we want to continue that uh, progress that we made and uh, take less money out of your pocket and spend what we have wisely I uh, want to focus on transportation, as I have been, on education, and again, on mental health. As my colleague mentioned, mental health, that's a big issue for me also. Thank you, sir. Next for his opening statement this evening, District 17 legislative candidate, Mr. Charles Warren. Mr. Warren, 60 seconds, sir. Good evening, everyone. Uh, John, I want to thank you for uh, thank you, sir. moderating this this evening. I want to thank the... Uh, POA Alliance for holding this forum, and I want to thank everyone that came out to this forum this evening. Uh, I'm a candidate for the North Carolina House of Representatives, District 17. Um, I will reinstate the Cold Ash Commission uh, because that has basically been a major problem uh, from Calabash all through the whole eastern coast. Uh, so I would want to keep our clean water safe from Calabas through the whole eastern coast and also keep our drinking water safe. So uh, I know that it was, uh, commission was in effect for a while, then the governor disbanded it. So uh, I would work to reinstate that commission. Thank you so much, and uh, I hope we have a good, interesting forum this evening. Thank you, sir. Mr. Eiler, I'm going to ask you for the first response to the first question, sir. The United States Supreme Court did not reverse the Fourth Circuit Appeals Court overturning the NC voter identification law. Do you, agree, do you agree with this decision, and what actions do you think 
the NC legislature should take to modify the bill, or should it just drop the issue at this point? Well, thank you, John. Uh, that's a good question because uh, they just recently overturned that, and the fact that Justice Scalia died on the Supreme Court, it's a 4 4 split, so they decided not to take it up because they were tied. Uh, again, it was a sorry decision that they made. We've passed two different voter ID bills. 35 states have voter ID. If your vote is cheapened, if people, if you don't know who's voting, it, the honest citizen's vote is cheapened by that, and so your vote doesn't really count as much as somebody that might be illegally voting. So again, um, we, we will take it up every time we need to to get it done. Mr. Warren, do you think that the General Assembly should take up and either modify the current voter ID bill or just drop the issue now? Well, John, I, I, I believe that the legislators should drop the issue. They have wasted enough of taxpayer money on all these frivolous laws that they have passed in the last few years because this is just one of the laws that the, Cape, the uh, court has knocked down. And I believe the uh, HB2 law is also going to be knocked down by the court. So I, and we have spent $500,000 of our disaster money, uh, the governor did, trying to defend it. So uh, I'm definitely not in favor of pursuing it. Thank you, sir. Mr. Benton, what actions do you think the legislature should take in, uh, in the voter ID law, or should it just drop the issue at this point? Oh, no, we need to go ahead and pursue this issue. This is an important thing. I'm at the polls every day, open to close, except for when I was here. I missed a couple hours. But we're seeing a lot of clerical errors just because somebody's name spelled similar, and you can check with the state board. You know, we had five instances in Leland. You know, there is, there are problems. Having an ID, you need to open a bank account, cash a check, get on welfare, any other government option, it is not discriminatory to do. So why is it discriminatory to cast your ballot? A lot of people are pushing now to see student IDs added to the list, and that would apparently fix the whole issue, according to the courts. But uh, who checks citizenship on uh, student IDs? Because anybody's allowed to enroll in college, and that would automatically give you voting privileges, basically making you a citizen. That's not correct, and that is not acceptable. I appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Mr. Warren, I'm going to ask you for the first response to the next question, sir. The backdrop is this. There's been a lot of discussion about the impact of increased homeowners insurance rate requests, particularly in coastal North Carolina counties. Many insurance companies are using a process known as consent to rate letters to increase the rates paid over and above what is authorized by the insurance commissioner's office, which effectively eliminated oversight by the state government. The question. Do you have any specific ideas to control the rates offered, or should we go to a totally unregulated insurance system? John, I really believe that the commission should be reinstated to oversee the rates. I don't think that we should go to an unregulated rate system because on the coast right now, the insurance rates are very, very high. And uh, this recently, they have not only on the coast, they have also gone inland with the same rates. So I would definitely recommend uh, that we have a commission to work on overseeing the rates and the rates heights. Mr. Benton, do you have any specific ideas to control the uh, homeowner's insurance rates that are offered, or should we go to a completely unregulated system of insurance in North Carolina? Well, you have the option if you receive the letter to keep your insurance or let it go. I would recommend you go find an insurance agent and let it go because we have over 6,000 insurers in the state of North Carolina. I myself took my house and put it under UPC, which is an out-of-state provider, which only cuts a limited number in the state. So just by them not covering large swaths of coastal communities, you're able to shop for a better rate. The other option, of course, is for reform. If we look at Charlotte's fire rates, for instance, they're, they have three times the rate we do, but we pay three times the fire percentage than they do. Because we, for some reason, because of some model for hurricanes, decided that we are a higher risk for all these other things. And if you look at the history of claims, we are actually have a lower percentage of claims than inland. So we should be paying less money, not more. Our homes are built 
to withstand these, where these inland areas like Fayetteville, for instance, are not built to hurricane standards. So that's why they get tons of damage and we don't see it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Eiler. The question, do you have any uh, specific ideas to control the rates offered by insurance companies or should we go to a totally unregulated system? John, I was part of a committee several years ago that got some reforms made in legislation, but the biggest one was the uh, loss history, using loss history as uh, Mr. Benton said, uh, Charlotte has three times the loss history that we do, and we pay three times the rates that they do. So there's nothing fair about that. There is no insurance commission, but I, I recommend actually uh, having an insurance commission. There's a commissioner, constitutionally elected, so even a constitutional amendment, to get rid of the commissioner and have a commission made of citizens to stand between us and the industry. Right now, there's nobody but the one man standing between us and the insurance industry. Mr. Allen, I'm going to ask you for the first response to the next question, sir. Do you support offshore drilling off the coast of North Carolina for oil or natural gas? What regulations need to be put in place to protect the coast if you do? Absolutely, John. I'm for all forms of energy that can be reasonably environmentally and economically feasible. Um, environmentally, we've got to protect our coast, no doubt about it. I think some of the uh, accidents we've had have been because of government regulation pushing out into deeper water. And that was been proven in the coastal horizons, uh, not coastal horizons, but the uh, deep water horizons accident uh, that they had in the Gulf. They, they kept pushing them out into deeper water and finally had an accident. So uh, we shot ourselves in the foot for nuclear power back at the Three Mile Island. Let's don't shoot ourselves in the foot on every other form of energy. Uh, nuclear would have been very clean and it was done away with almost as far as new plants. Uh, there's no reason we should should not consider every option, including wind, solar, and everything that's feasible economically and environmentally. Thank you, sir. Mr. Benton, do you support offshore drilling off the coast of North Carolina for oil or gas? And what regulations need to be put in place to protect the environment if you do? Well, I uh, think we need to leave all options open. I don't know enough about it, honestly, to make an informed decision. I know there's going, there, Governor McCory spoke about profit sharing for us, and that would be great because a lot of folks in Brunswick County are uh, over a certain age, and when y'all leave, I hate to say this, it's gonna leave us kind of in a spot with a lot of houses, a lot of vacant land, a lot of tax bills that need to be paid, and we need to make sure the kids have jobs. But I I'm, live on the river on the Cape Fear, I'm not uh, interested in doing anything that could harm there, or uh, I fish enough out of a Sunset Beach here because I go fishing out there all the time. But uh, as for the insurance uh, deal, I just want to say make sure you check what your legislator has taken. My opponent took $20,000 in the last two quarters from insurance companies. And that just gives you an idea on how tough they are pushing the uh, current people sitting in office to make sure things don't change. Mr. Warren, do you support offshore drilling off the coast of North Carolina for oil or natural gas, and if you do, what government regulations need to be put in place to protect the coast? John, I do not support offshore oil drilling, seismic testing, nor fracking. I know, uh, I think the previous legislator have basically support fracking, uh, and I'm definitely against that because of the possibility of earthquakes. I support clean energy, you know, um, solo, uh, wind, when it's not on the beach uh, or if it's not in a populated area. I would support it in an isolated area with the windmills and uh, solo, yeah, I support solo because that would definitely uh, be a form of clean energy. Thank you, sir. And Mr. Warren, I'm going to ask you for the first response to the next question, if I may. There was a flurry of criticism regarding the filing of a bill in the last General Assembly session prior to any discussion with town officials to remove portions of Sunset Beach from its development oversight. What would your position have been on this issue? Did the General Assembly make the right decision? No, they did not make the right decision. Um, from what I can understand on that bill that wanted to de annex both ends of Sunset Beach, you have, uh, it's in the FEMA zone. Yeah. And basically in the FEMA zone, you did not have um, the right to put uh, 
development in that area. So I would not be in favor of that, but I know that my opponent, basically he had uh, made a proposal that they in turn put swimming pools in the front, and they were going to work out and, and pass the deal so that that would go, but the committee denied it. So definitely, I'm not in sure of, uh, I'm not in favor of the annexing any portion of Sunset Beach unless the residents come together and they, that's what they want. Thank you, sir. Mr. Eiler, there was a criticism regarding the filing of a bill before any discussion with town officials to remove parts of Sunset Beach from its development oversight. Did the General Assembly make the right decision? Well, actually, the General Assembly did not pass that bill, so yes, it made the right decision. I'm not sure what other folks are talking about. However, uh, the bill was, was uh, proposed in the Senate and passed the Senate. When it got to the House. I slowed it down for seven weeks to give folks a chance to talk. I did talk to town officials very quickly after that came over to the House. And I'm not sure what sort of information is coming from. And the town officials know I did. So uh, I slowed it down in the House, uh, and it finally failed in committee as it was written. And if it comes up again, it'll be quite different and be a last resort, not a first resort. But it, it may come up again next session, but again, that's not my decision. It'll probably start in the Senate, and we'll just have to see where we stand at that point. And, uh, the, the state creates towns and delegates certain things to them, uh, charters towns, and uh, they can set their boundaries. So it's perfectly legal to do that, but it's a last resort. Thank you, sir. Mr. Benton, there was some criticism regarding the filing of a bill prior to any discussion with town officials that would remove portions of Sunset Beach from its development oversight. Did the General Assembly make the right decision? I think we have the right decision here that uh the bill did not pass. Uh, town officials got involved and stopped this and took care of it. And I believe the developers were using this as a strong arm tactic to try to uh, force the town into doing something they didn't want to do. And uh, I, th I think that this is taken care of. And uh, I have a lot of close personal ties here uh, to Sunset Beach. Uh, you know, my uncle sits on the board over there and uh, our family has a couple houses over there. So it's near to dear to my heart. And, I grew up basically playing and staying on that beach uh, every summer, so yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Mr. Benton, I'm going to ask you for the first response to the next question. The bathroom bill HB2 continues to generate significant discussion pro and con, as well as the impact on North Carolina's economy. The bill was passed by both houses of the General Assembly and was signed by the governor in one day of a special session without allowing public discussion. Mr. Benton, the question is, did you believe that the General Assembly made the right decision? Do you support HB2? I uh, support two of the three parts. One part is a private property issue. The town has no business telling you who can and cannot use your bathroom on your private property. That is your space. You pay for it. You make the decisions. Second part is protecting the women and children in the bathrooms in public facilities. It is not the transgender folks they are worried about. It is any other individual or a fender who wants to walk in there and use them. I support that part. The third part was limiting discrimination suits. And in my district, we had history of the Wilmington 10. And, you know, there's a long history there of uh, some questionable decisions here, in, let's say, in the uh, past. And I don't want to take anybody's right to uh, fight a discrimination suit away. But uh, I do not support uh, that final portion, but the other two portions I suggest we leave in place. They make sense, and if folks don't want to come here, that is their option. And I applaud them for living by their principles. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Warren, did the General Assembly make the right decision regarding HB2 in the General Assembly session that just passed? No, they did not. Um, that bill has cost this state potentially five billion dollars. We are basically the laughing stock of the world. There's a lot of counties and states that will not come to North Carolina because of the bill. Now, the bathroom bill is considered is, does not have that much to do with the bathroom because there was never any problems as far as people using bathrooms. Transgenders 
have gone into bathrooms and used them. You know, they go into a store, they shut the store. It's not about the kids. And secondly, they had no enforcement mechanism into it. So what are you going to do? You're going to have a cop stand by every bathroom door and uh, if, see who's going in and out? I mean, to me, it was totally ridiculous. Mr. Eiler, the General Assembly passed HB2 during the last General Assembly session. Did the General Assembly make the right decision? Absolutely, John. Uh, and I'm not sure what my opponent's talking about. However, it's a constitutional issue. Charlotte didn't have the right to do what they did. We create towns, we, we delegate things like zoning. We don't delegate everything to tell everybody what to do in, in, inside towns. They're also citizens of North Carolina. So Charlotte didn't have the right to do what they did. They created the problem. We put everything back just like it was. So any business making a decision after HB2, any making a decision today different from what it was before, is not making a business decision. It's it's totally public relations or feel good or whatever they're thinking is exactly like it was before. There's no business reason to make those decisions, but they can do what they want. It's also a free country for the decisions they make, as well as it's freedom for the private property owners, the business owners that can do whatever they want. But in Charlotte, they would not have been able to had that ordinance stood. Mr. Eiler, your ref response first to the next question. During the last General Assembly session, an effort was made to limit eminent domain seizures to public use only, but the effort failed. Do you support the limit? Why or why not? We have an eminent domain bill almost every session since I've been up there. And um, I am for private property. Uh, I think eminent domain is overly used in many cases. And uh, there are remedies through the courts, but it's also very expensive to protect your private property in court. So I think eminent domain, an eminent domain bill to protect private property owners is absolutely necessary. And it hasn't passed before because it requires a constitutional amendment. It should be done every session until we get it done. Mr. Benton, do you support the uh, eminent domain seizures to public use only? Why or why not? I do. I believe the. Uh and we also need to take that power away from local municipalities because there is a way that they can still quick take uh, property away from you without you even having a hearing in North Carolina. There is a 90-day plan. Everything should at least be the 120-day plan, the uh, course of action, because you have a right to go to court and you have the right in North Carolina, you should, to know how they're going to come up with your fair market value. And uh, right now it's kind of it's kind of wishy-washy on how they're going to do that, and there should definitely be a uh, in-writing way for them to decide how much they're going to pay you if you somehow end up in the way of a major highway like we're talking about with that sky bridge coming through the up by uh, Brunswick Forest or anywhere else. I mean, my home in Mercer Avenue, I got the warning in, uh, that I was going to lose my home because Independence Expressway needed a park down the middle of four so they could go to four lanes with a big bike park through the middle. So it's of concern, and it touches home. and I. Thank you, sir. Mr. Warren, the effort was made in the last session to limit eminent domain seizures to public use only, but it failed. Do you support the limit? Why or why not? Yes, I support the limit. I feel that it would be the necessary thing to do for uh, private individuals when they come through for them to have a right to uh, basically determine what they can get for their property, uh, not necessarily eminent domain just coming and taking it and then telling you based on the figures, uh, I guess, that they get from the uh, register of deeds, uh, what your value are. So uh, I would support uh, yeah, eminent domain policies to protect the private citizens. Thank you, sir. Mr. Warren, I'm going to ask for your response to the next question first. Along the coast of North Carolina, the shallow draft inlets are critical for use by commercial fishermen and recreational boaters. Beach renourishment, coupled with the sand removed from these inlets during dredging, is the key to the tourism industry, not just in Brunswick County, but all along the coast. So the question is, in light of cutbacks in federal funding, what role do you see the state government playing in supporting these needs? Well, John, I see the state, along with the counties, uh, coming together to help renourish, do beach renourishments. I just feel like it's so important because 
on along the coaster uh, coast from Calabash through the eastern coast, we uh, tourism is our major industries, and we definitely need commercial fishermen. So I would uh, support uh, beach the state and the counties coming together, working out a plan, and putting funding together for the beach renourishment. Thank you, sir. Mr. Eiler, what uh, role do you see the state government playing in supporting beach renourishment and dredging of the shallow draft inlets? Thank you, John. This is an issue that's come up a lot since I've been there, and uh, uh, shallow draft inlets are important to our recreational and our commercial fishermen. Uh, and we have increased the, the funds in the past budget from around $5 million to almost $25 million, uh, using the um, part of the gas tax, which boaters pay gas for gas, and they pay gas tax. So this is their highway to get out to the fishing grounds or get out to the recreational fishing. So child draft in it, yes, we've taken care of that. The next step needs to be beach renourishment. It'd be treated like infrastructure, just like our highways and like our other infrastructure uh, on, on the coast. So again, beach uh, renourishment, sand uh, maintenance, I like to call it, beach maintenance, needs to be uh, part of our budget in the state since the federal government is getting out of the dredging business and other things related to the coast. The state's gonna have to get into it. Mr. Benton, what role do you see the state government playing in beach renourishment and dredging of shallow draft inlets? Well, I have no beaches in my district but <laughs> we take a lot of your money when you come through Wilmington and your folks stay on the islands and come through. So I think it's important we uh, tackle that. We need to get creative though. We need, I know some communities have done like a quarter for a plastic bag for every plastic bag that's shipped in and it's kind of like a way to sit, keep the sea turtle safe and uh, get some money for beach renourishment. The shallow, the shallow drafts are very important. We, you know, I didn't just buy a boat here so I can't use it either, but uh, I know a lot of you folks are, uh, fish and enjoy the recreation a lot of our tourists do and that's very important we keep that open i think we're going to have to continue to use the uh, gas money and the highway money and uh get just get creative and keep it going because it's uh it's tough to live down here without a uh the environment being right and it's important thank you thank you sir uh, ladies and gentlemen we're going to now ask our candidates for the legislative districts to give us their closing statements, no more than 60 seconds. And we're gonna begin, we'll go in the reverse order that we went for the opening statements. So we'll begin first with District 17 legislative candidate, Mr. Charles Warren. Mr. Warren, 60 seconds, sir. Okay. Yes, I would like to thank John for uh, moderating this affair. And again, I'd like to thank the uh, association uh, for hosting this. And I want to thank everyone who came out to support it tonight. I am basically so uh, interested in offshore oil drilling and cement testing. That's one of the major things that I want to make sure that we uh, work on when I get in the legislature. I also, uh, that again, that HB2 bill, which has cost the state, I said, five, potentially five billion dollars. Uh, that is such a disgrace and to our state from where we used to be such a progressive state where a lot of people wanted to come here. Now everybody is avoiding to come into to North Carolina. Uh, I am also in favor of uh, reinstating the Coal Ash Commission. Okay. Uh, and I do want to ask everyone for your vote. Thank you, sir. Next, we will go to District 17 candidate, Mr. Frank Eiler. Mr. Eiler, 60 seconds, sir. Thank you, John, and thanks again, John, and thanks to the ABC POA for hosting this. Um, John, I'm not, not sure what some of the folks are paying attention to, my opponent or whoever, uh, but we've done a lot of good things, and they seem to be focused on one or two things that they can raise questions about, which, you know, but education, in transportation, lowering taxes, taking less of your money, uh, the whole thing. Every family has saved money on sales tax the last five years. Uh, four, a family of four saved about $2,000 a piece on just on the sales tax. Uh, the business taxes have gone down, small business, 
Next year we'll be paying about 3% due to the, the policies we put in that's actually lowered rates and increased revenue. So we're getting a reduction next year to 3% and it used to be about 6%. So cutting the taxes in half for families and businesses. And again, you know, we need, need to continue lower taxes, lower regulation, and keep doing what we've been doing for it's paying off for the economy, fastest growing economy, one of the fastest growing in the country. Thank you, sir. For our final closing statement this evening, we will go to District 18 legislative candidate, Mr. Gerald Benton. Mr. Benton, 60 seconds, sir. Thank you for coming out today, folks. Our representation is like our representation here tonight, missing. There needs to be a change. HB2 costs us approximately 50 mil, or $500 million out of $510 billion of the state budget. That's less than 0.1%. So we are blowing up every political stage on this issue. I've been on TV in 12 states so far on Fox because of this. It is crazy. Education should be our number one concern. I represent, like I said, Wilmington. They have an 83% graduation rate, which is excellent but we only have a 20% proficiency rate in mathematics. Here in Brunswick County, kids graduate high school and can't sign their own names. How are they supposed to go out and cash their first paycheck? We had a mother who ran for school board here earlier today and she talked about her three kids and the first thing she did when she got them after they graduated was teach them to sign their names so they can get their first paycheck in the bank and know what it feels like to be a person and a citizen. Mental health reform, the state needs to go ahead and step up. It's gonna save us a ton of money to go ahead and get clinics in every county. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, our three candidates running for the legislative seats representing Brunswick County.